All right, Montana's going to get us set up because everything turned off when it went black. Um, but I'll just start by introducing us in our department. And I'm going to talk just really briefly on some of the higher level organizational structures, mission, um, and then Montana, who is our Deputy Director of Community Development, is going to talk to us about all the things that live under that umbrella. And Walter Banziger, uh, our other Deputy Director of Development Services, will talk to us about all things in the built environment. Um, so my name is Erin Pahan. I'm the director of CPDI. Uh, I came to the city by way of the nonprofit sector, served as the director of the Pavarello Center for about a decade, um, and moved into this position uh, feeling like I was terrifyingly unexperienced <laughs> for the, the role that I stepped into. Um, but as I uh, really started to weed into these issues of growth in our community, realized that as a licensed clinical social worker, I was perhaps uniquely qualified to do the job. And you will hear tonight the themes of growth and equity um, and maintaining our values and maintaining our culture, what makes Missoula, Missoula, as we continue to grow. Um, so bringing in that lens of equity has been something that we have cultivated very strongly in our department over the last couple of years. Um, so I am going to share just a little bit about our mission. So community planning, development, and innovation promotes equitable growth and a resilient and sustainable community. And we do that through two different arms, one of those being our community development arm. And through that arm, we really focus on the creation of innovative programs, policy, and planning. And you'll hear more about that from Montana, but that includes things like our 10-year plan to end homelessness, our work around uh, climate resiliency, as well as some of the incredible work we're doing around housing and affordable housing. The other arm is development services, our built environment. And we work to achieve that mission through the efficient and responsive application of code and the delivery of development services. So kind of those nuts and bolts of the things we do every day to get new homes permitted and built, uh, to support economic development, to make sure that as things build and, and build up in our community, they're building up safely. There's always something in the news, but especially pertinent now with the devastating earthquakes that have recently happened in Turkey. When, when we build, we need to build safely, especially as we're building up and more dense. Our building department makes sure that happens here. Um, and also things like code compliance, making sure again that that we're abiding by the ordinances that our policymakers, city council set, especially when they pertain to health and safety. Uh, so this is just a little snapshot of our leadership team in our department. We have a lot of fantastic people. Um, Emily Armstrong, who oversees our houseless initiatives, our 10-year plan to end homelessness, among other things. Walter, of course, who's here with us tonight. Aaron Bowman, our building official, again, overseeing those code elements to ensure our community is safe. Kirsten Hands, our business and finance manager. Um, she keeps us all moving in the right direction. Uh, Ricky Henderson oversees our policy programs. Those include our housing programs as well as our climate action work. Montana, who is here with us tonight, and you'll hear more from. Mary McRae oversees our land use and zoning. So all of those codes and what's called Title 20 today, um, what will be called something different when we complete our comprehensive code reform project underway. Maggie McCarthy, who came to us just about a year ago from the university and is our business, our permits and business license manager. Lavelle Means, who's um, like Mary, uh, works in that planning realm and has been with the city about 25 years, oversees our community planning. So sometimes that's called long range planning. So it's, it's focused on how we grow over the next 20, 30, 40 years and still maintain our values and what is important to us. Uh, and then Tracy Pondorf, who also came to us from the university and serves as our grants program manager. Um, so you, you can't see this, <laughs> but, but I wanted to give you just an idea of the depth and breadth of our department. Um, we have about 65 individuals who work from us, who come to us from all sectors. Some like me, coming from the nonprofit sector, 
um, others coming from public civil service at the university, from the state of Montana, um, from other cities and states nationwide, and more and more often people from the private sector, um, people who could make much more money doing what they do for someone else in the private sector, but they choose to come and work for the city because they're committed to civil service and understand the power that local government can have in the lives of our residents. And so I um, just wanted to give you a sense of all these fantastic people. You can go on our website and there's a link to this org chart on the front page. You can see all the pictures of these folks and get a sense of who you might interact with when you come in our doors. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of programmatic areas before I turn it over to Montana to talk to you about our community development arm. And these are a few areas that in that org chart, they kind of blend between our two arms of community development and development services. So things that, that don't really live neatly in one bucket because they serve both branches of our department. One of those is our work around community engagement. And I know you all got to hear from Ashley Britner Wells last week about this new philosophy that we're um, really trying to cultivate, not just in our department, we're piloting it in our department, but we're working to infuse it across the entire city to make sure that our engagement is inclusive and accessible to community members, that we're not reactive, but we're being proactive and uh, developing policies and programs hand in hand with our community so we know that they're going to meet the needs that uh, our community is expressing at any given point in time. Um, we're also thinking about these as an add-on. We don't want to stop doing the engagement that we do today. And in many instances, we're actually legally mandated to do it the way we're doing it today. And that's especially true for some of our land use practices. The state, um, the Montana Code annotated really outlines, you have to put a newspaper ad in, you have to have this type of a meeting, you have to submit the meeting notes in this type of a way. Um, so we're gonna still have to do those, those legal, um, legally mandated forms of engagement, but we know that we're not reaching people that way, um, that it, it, we're not reaching deeply into the community in that way. And so um, we want to try something new that we can add on to that process. Um, and then, you know, with the broader goal of ensuring that Missoula residents are given the opportunity to meaningfully engage in the things that matter most to them. They don't have to come to every meeting and they don't have to engage in every space, but we want to be able to get um, our community and all of you the information to be able to say, oh yes, this does matter to me and I want to be here. Maybe I'll pass on that one. You have to be able to inform the broad community uh, so people can have that opportunity to opt in. And then I'm gonna uh, next talk just a little bit about community planning, and that's overseen by Laval Means, who uh, has been with the city several decades now and just brings a plethora of experience and passion for helping Missoula, again, grow in a way that is equitable and that is um, resilient and sustainable um, and that preserves our values and what matters to us. Community planning serves our policy and development or community development arm as well as our development services and built environment arm because again we do that long-term forecasting and part of that long-term forecasting is making sure we're setting the policies and the programs in place that will serve as tools that will help us achieve our goals um, but it also has a direct impact in our land use code that we're building and that we're implementing every single day i um, mean there are a couple of specific projects we'll talk about that do that so what is community planning? It's really uh, an opportunity to talk about our values as a community and to talk about how we want to grow as a community. It again includes elements of land use code, growth analysis. So we're constantly analyzing how are we growing? What do these trends look like? Are we moving in a direction that we want to be moving in? Are we being thoughtful in that? It also includes resident engagement and participation participation, both through our engagement philosophy and through the fantastic work of Missoula Neighborhoods, which, which I know you got a great overview of last week as well. And then it also includes retaining and protecting our communal character. And we primarily do that through our historic preservation program, really, again, defining um, what makes Missoula, Missoula, um, and what has continued to define us through decades, and how do we retain pieces of that? Um, while acknowledging it, that, that some of that um, was place-based and, and we need to reassess as well. So what does our community planning team actually do within CPDI? Um, in terms of land use and growth analysis, 
Some of our biggest projects are the R Missoula policy update and code reform, and I have a little more information about that to come, as well as something called our R Missoula development guide. And so the growth policy update is something that happens every five years and is mandated by the state of Montana. In Montana, we call it a growth policy. In other states, they call it a comprehensive plan. Really what it is is, again, it's that long-term uh, vision or forecast about how we want to develop as a community. It should be far looking, 30, 40 years um, down the road. So we're challenging ourselves to be thoughtful in every decision we make to move us in that direction. The R Missoula Development Guide is an annual um, report and analysis that we issue that looks at our progress towards that growth policy. Are we moving in the right direction? Um, what does our development look like? What trending are we starting to see in terms of homes or commercial development? Um, how is that supporting our economic development goals? And so it's, it's kind of a broad looking analysis of all of those areas. Missoula Neighborhoods, again, I know you heard a lot about this last week, but really um, supports our neighborhood councils, the community forum, and our neighborhood grants, as well as supporting the creation of this new engagement philosophy, which they will be incredible partners in that work. And then our historic preservation work, which consists of supporting the Historic Preservation Commission, which is a body within the city of Missoula that um, both provides guidance and feedback to the Missoula City Council, but actually also holds some legislative authority to do things like approve or deny historic preservation permits or historic demolition, demolition permits. And so they do have some real decision-making authority as well. Um, they also have created the, the beginnings of a preservation toolkit. Much of our preservation work locally is done through incentives. Um, we don't have a lot of teeth to mandate historic preservation. And so we really work to try to arm property owners in our community with all of the tools that they would need to move down that path through their own volition. And um, also, again, that vested authority with the preservation and demolition permits of um, supporting people who want to preserve either a district or an individually listed property across the city, of which we have many. And then also assessing um, when, it, when it's appropriate for one to be demolished. And oftentimes through that process, we can um, both determine how to preserve aspects of uh, a building during a rehabilitation or an adaptive reuse, or if a building is going to be demolished, we can help preserve that history in some other way. It could be through um, salvaging and reusing some of the materials in a redeveloped building or documenting that history as well so it isn't completely lost. Um, and then I just want to share a little bit about the Our Missoula Growth Policy Update in Code Reform Project, which is one of the biggest and most exciting projects our department will undertake in the next several years. Um, we really are looking at overhauling our land use code. Our land use code today um, is, uh, is better than it, it was in the past, but really we've been band-aiding land use code from the 70s and, and making small tweaks and small fixes on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, and we've just gotten to the point where it just doesn't work. It's not supporting our goals. We haven't given us the tools. Oh. Hold on, let me see if I can get this back into share mode. There we go. Um, it isn't giving us the tools that we need to achieve our goals. And in many instances, it's actually actively preventing us from achieving our goals. And so, so we, we can say it's bad without getting too defensive. We know this, it's bad. Um, and we, we need to just do a complete overhaul and, and um, create a new code from start to finish that's gonna help us achieve our goals. Um, these are some of the, the, the top 10 goals that we've identified through code reform that we want to focus on. Again, that inclusive community engagement, making sure that we're working hand in hand with the community throughout this process so that at the end of the day, there will be a code that everyone sees themselves in. Um, focusing on addressing the city's current challenges. Um, some of the things that we talk about often, housing affordability. 
um, climate change, sustainability, that those are all issues that are incredibly important to the city and that we have been charged with prioritizing and elevating by our elected officials in the city council. And so we know those are themes that, that we hear from our constituents and that will come into this process. Developing a unified development code. Um, this starts to get a little bit into the wonky planner speak, but what we hear a lot from our development community is that we have a Title 20, which is our land use code. We have a Title 12, which is our public works code. We have a Title 15, which is our building code. We also have a Title 10, which is our parks code, and a Title 8, which is our health department code. And developers have to bounce back and forth between all of these, trying to interpret um, how interpret sections that are supposed to be clear and tell them how to move their projects ahead, but oftentimes conflict with one another. And so we are moving down the path of creating what's called a unified development ordinance. A developer can go to one code or ordinance and it will contain all of the information for all of those codes. And it will be um, not only put in one place, but streamlined, and all of those areas of conflict will be removed as part of that process. Uh, communities across the state have gone to a unified development ordinance. It's not a silver bullet. We still have to interpret and apply the code efficiently and effectively, but it's, it's a huge first start for us. We also need to address our growth policy elements, which include equity, health, sustainability, climate action, and access to affordable housing. And I might just back up for a, a minute and explain the relationship between the growth policy and our land use code. Um, growth policy is really the document that articulates our values and sets our goal. That's our mission and our vision and talks about uh, where we want to move as a community. Our land use code is how we get there. It's the on the ground tools that we apply to development projects across the community to make sure we are going to achieve the goals in that growth policy. And so both documents are really important. We have to be clear in our vision and mission, and then we have to ensure we have the tools that can help us move in that direction. If we aren't clear with our mission, our tools won't, won't correlate in the way that we need to get them there. And if we're clear in our mission, but we don't create the tools through our, our code, um, we can't get there, and, and I think that's where Missoula has been. We have a fantastic vision in our growth policy. Our growth policy is often heralded as an incredibly progressive document, not just by folks in our community, but statewide. Um, we haven't created the tools that we need to actualize that vision, and that's the step we're taking now. Down here, uh, it's difficult to see, but really looking at incentives for inclusive and environmentally friendly development. So green building, sustainability, um, again, how do we live the values articulated in our growth policy? Promoting incremental, well-conceived, innovative, and responses, responsive approaches to neighborhood and community revitalization. Um, one thing we often say in our department is that no neighborhood single-handedly is expected to solve our housing issues but no neighborhood is exempt from that solution as well. And so it's really about working to define approaches that make sense for each individual neighborhood within our community and for each individual sector within our community. Encouraging innovative development. How do we look outside of the box? How do we do things differently? How do we partner with the private sector in ways that um, can help us move further down that line? Um, again, create accessible, walkable, vibrant streets and neighborhoods that speaks to some of our, our goals around transportation and transportation infrastructure. Encouraging diverse, attainable housing options, um, something we talk about often at the city, and encouraging collaborative, efficient, and inclusive process, both in the development of this code and in its implementation. There we go. Yay, we're back. Okay. Um, so this is just a timeline, and I'm not going to go through this in depth. Um, I'm just going to use this to try to point you all in the direction. Um, in the direction of the Our Missoula Engage Missoula site. And so we have a really robust website around code reform. You can type Our Missoula Code Reform into Google search, and it will take you right to that site. And we have a lot of baseline information, um, but we have a lot of great graphics like this that talk about the timeline. How is this process going to take out? It is lengthy. Um, it takes a long time to work 
in a really collaborative fashion with your community. Again, we want to create this code hand in hand with our community, which means we can't rush that process. But we also are going to have deliverables throughout. There is an urgency in the moment, especially as it applies to housing, and especially as it applies to climate. And we acknowledge that. And so we also want to bring to the community solutions throughout as we identify those, and as we hear from the community that those make sense. And so we've got some deliverables mapped out as well. All right, and now I'm going to pass it off to Montana. Good evening. Uh, I'm Montana James. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Development. I'm going to try this and see if it works. Can you still hear me OK? All right. So I, similarly to how Aaron approached the community planning team, I want to start with a little bit on what is community development. Uh, this is one of those terms that I think can mean really different things depending on where you are, the context, who you're talking to. So um, I want to just start there. Uh, so I think there's a different uh, definition kind of between academic practice and professional practice but there are some unifying elements. So typically, community development tends to be locally defined. What are the issues that are most important in the community? Um, and it usually includes elements of economic opportunity, social justice, resilience and sustainability, and really strong community engagement to define those issues. Um, at the municipal level, community development teams or departments are often um, formed based on funding streams that are available as well. So, so what are the programs federally and otherwise that can support the work um, and those goals? So in Missoula, our community development team uh, and the issue areas that, that we work on have shifted and changed over the last several years, but they've been shaped by some of those elements. So what funding streams are available to kind of sustain the office and our work, um, but also public feedback through surveys and community meetings, uh, and then an examination, examination of kind of what are those top issues, and then what are the gaps in the community. So economic development might be a really top issue, but we have some good organizations uh, that are doing that work and tackling it really comprehensively. So where, where are the gaps that we can fill in at the local government level? So our team is split into three programs right now. So we have our grant programs. Uh, and that team works with U.S. Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development funds. Uh, we have uh, Environmental Protection Agency funds through the Brownfields program. Uh, we have our local Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And then we have a few other sort of ad hoc grant funded projects that are a little bit more time limited. We use our policy programs team that Aaron mentioned to really tackle policy issues that are important at the local level. And that can sometimes mean passing new policy, uh, resolutions, uh, and sometimes it means really implementing those policies and, and testing new programs. So both of our policy teams in the, form, the formation that they are now uh, work from a set of adopted goals or plans or strategies that have been adopted by city council. Uh, our climate action team is working to implement a very large number of, of uh, ambitious goals. Um, they come in the form of resolutions uh, and they center on reducing carbon emissions at the municipal level, at the community level, reducing waste, and then becoming more resilient as a, a community as we adapt to climate change. Our housing policy staff is working right now to implement what is basically over 25, 26 different recommendations and programs from our current housing policy. Uh, we adopted our housing policy in 2019 at the city level, and that was really the first time that the city took on, in a, in a concentrated way, a housing policy effort since, uh, I think, 1992. 
Um, so it's big work and it's varied work. Um, but that team is also really thinking about that policy and reflecting on an annual basis as well and thinking about how we need to tweak um, and adapt the policy as the market changes. And last, our houseless programs work to collaboratively tackle the issue of houselessness in the community in a few ways. So they administer and report on the community's plan to end homelessness. That is also a very ambitious goal and not language that comes from us that or originated with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development in a, a process that they undertook over a decade now to really incentivize local communities to just take on this planning and strategy work. This team also acts as the hub and the administrative infrastructure of the Missoula Coordinated Entry System. And I will talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few slides. But that system came out of that Reaching Home plan, that 10-year plan, and it was launched in 2017. And finally, this team also supports other city departments, the Coordinated Entry System and community partners in just responding to emergent issues uh, in that realm of houselessness. So uh, dealing with really severe weather and working with community partners and um, folks on the ground to make sure that, that we've got shelter for everyone, um, uh, supporting staff across the city and managing encampments if the health situation gets, gets pretty bad. Um, and I want to make a quick note about the shift to this terminology of houselessness. That is somewhat new, and it's admittedly a little bit clunkier than homeless. But we've been making that, uh, that shift intentionally based on feedback from residents who are unhoused and who have, have felt really strongly that they are not homeless. They have a home. Missoula is their home. But they just do not have a house. So we've tried to shift that language in recent years. All right, so I know you saw the really big org chart of the whole department earlier, and you can see this is sort of the, the community development half of the department. So it's not the biggest team in the department, but we have a range of really highly skilled staff working in each of these policy areas and grant programs. And then we also have a, a fantastic coordinator who works across our programs and is really our sort of data guru that brings us all together. All right, so what does all of that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a lot more than I can share in 20 minutes or so. So I'm just going to dive into a few really specific examples of programs or projects that we've worked on in recent years to give you a sense, and then I'm happy to answer questions. So one of the really foundational roles of the community development team at the city is um, as administrators for those uh, funding sources that I mentioned. And so three of our funding streams are focused on housing. Each year, we host what we call a unified funding round, and that pairs all of our different housing funding streams together. And the goal of that process is to really take the onus of applying off of the project um, and then put it back on our team to identify which funding stream might be a good fit for each project, because they each have their own kind of unique requirements and character. So we host that round in January and February of each year. And the funds available through that round are the Home Investment Partnership Funds through HUD, the Community Development Block Grant Funds through HUD as well, and then that local Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is a more flexible source of funding. So essentially, partners come in. They bring us their projects. They apply for the funds. They make the case for their project, whatever it is. It might be construction of housing. It might be acquisition of property or of housing to keep it affordable. Or it might be programs or services that they're offering. And then this year, for the first year, we have some one-time additional funds from HUD called the Home ARP funds. And so that adds a, another layer of funding available. 
So, like I mentioned, these funding streams do come with some restrictions and requirements. So they primarily revolve around the beneficiaries of the projects and the HUD funding streams are much more restrictive and they have really key targets that we have to meet. And they're targeted towards folks based on what they call area median income. So the, the income of the person who will be living in the home or accessing the service, it, it's targeted toward folks uh, at 80% of area median income or below. And I do have a handout that I'll, that I'll give you all after this that talks a little bit about what that AMI number is. Um, let's see. So this is kind of the basic overview of those funding categories. And then just some examples of projects that we've funded in recent years that you might know. One is Lee Gordon Place right over here next to the library. That's a community land trust. Um, and then we've also funded the Trinity and the Bellagio projects. So those are some of the bigger projects that we've funded in recent years. All right, so Brownfields is another funding stream. And as I mentioned, through the Environmental Protection Agency federally. And these funds are really intended to be used to assess and clean up properties that have some sort of contamination. Um, so often they are warehouses or commercial sites that have been used over the years um, in a way that has created contamination on the site and that's a barrier to redevelopment. Uh, our team at the city has developed a really competitive brownfields program. These funds, unlike our HUD funds, have to be applied for. So you do have to apply and then competitively be award the, awarded the funds. And the Brownfields program has brought millions of dollars into the community for this redevelopment work over the years. So one example of a project is the MRL Triangle site. So this site was owned by Montana Rail Link for many years um, and then was donated to the city. And it's contaminated with, uh, a lot of it is lead paint, asbestos is a, a very common one, um, and some other contaminants. And it is listed right now as a state Superfund site. And so our, the Brownfields program has brought in funds and the park, of course, has been already cleaned up to standards that the Department of Environmental Quality says good to go for use. And we're working right now on this top part, the development parcel, and that work is, is a pretty long, onerous process to get the site delisted by the State Department, Department of Environmental Quality. Um, and it involves a lot of layers of plans and review by that team. And then it will culminate in the actual cleanup of the site and create a potential for redevelopment there. And that will also involve a lot of planning in, in the community and in the neighborhood to determine what's next on that site. So basically you're saying that like the bottom triangle's done and then the yellow top <coughs> you are still in the process of beginning to start? Yes. Is like where Sovereign Cove Church is or the like yeah. housed shelter or like the Paul Rail Center Winter Shelter? Yep. It's those, so there's current uses on that top site and the environmental cleanup pieces are gonna be in the buildings. So with asbestos in the current state, it's fine the way it is, but then once they, to, in order to tear it down or adapt the building, right, you have to go in and disturb that asbestos. And so at that point, then the buildings will have to go once we're ready to do that. But we have to get DEQ's approval to, to do it in the way that they would like us to. To, to, they make sure that all of the levels are checked and that the approach is adequate. Um, and so that's what that next step will be. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to the policy teams a little bit. Um, our climate action team, as I mentioned, is responsible for helping the city achieve a number of really ambitious goals. So we are, or have set out the goal to be carbon neutral in our municipal operations by 2025, to be at 100% clean electricity in the community by 2030, to achieve zero waste by 2050, and to achieve community-wide carbon neutrality by 2050. And then we also have a resilience plan that speaks to how we wanna make sure our residents are able to adapt to hotter summers, more severe winters. 
So those are really tough goals <laughs> and it's really big work. Uh, so that team really just in the last few years has shifted away from the goal setting space to the implementation space. And one of the ways that they're tackling that implementation is through what's called a strategic implementation team. And that was just formed in the last year. And it includes members of departments across the city. So folks from streets and parks and public works all come together on a regular basis and talk through these goals and collectively come up with ways to achieve those goals or to get progress towards those goals. So they've been working on education and outreach across the city. Um, they've been working on developing a climate lens, which is really just a decision-making framework for city staff uh, across the city to consider climate and climate impacts in decisions that are made. And then they have drafted two really important policies for, for municipal operations. One is about vehicle emissions. So when we purchase new vehicles for fleet, for the streets department, what, what do we consider and how do we incorporate um, climate and carbon emissions into those decisions? Uh, and then sustainable building. So whenever the city or a city building is renovated in a, in a big project or a new building is constructed, what are our targets and how do we set goals around um, waste reduction and energy efficiency? And then our housing policy is also very ambitious. So as I mentioned, it was adopted in 2019. And since that time, we've made some good progress towards um, reaching each of, each of those program areas and policy areas that are contained in the policy. So every year, our staff creates what they call a landscape assessment, or just kind of a, an annual look at where we are in the housing market based on the programs that we fund, what have we achieved in the year, and then what are those indicators looking like? How have they changed over the last year? Home sales price, um, rental prices, and a number of other things. They work really closely with the organization of realtors that, that creates that online dashboard and tracks that a lot of those indicators um, on a regular basis, and then we, we add some additional pieces into that assessment. Uh, we've also created a, an internal tracking system so that we know when dedicated affordable units in Missoula are nearing their sunset. So a lot of the affordable housing has been constructed with, with federal funds or through federal programs, and they have a certain set of years where they have to stay affordable. And once it gets past that year, they could potentially flip to market rate. And so we're watching and tracking those properties and then working proactively with partners to, to keep an eye on them and make sure we're doing what we can to keep them affordable. We also adopted the trust fund that I've talked a little bit about, and that's really a, a centerpiece of that policy to have a local funding source that can be a gap, that can can be there in an emergency to fund the acquisition of a, of a unit that is a, about to flip to market rate. Um, and then the administration of that fund has been several years in the making, just making sure that we have the right oversight, the right systems in place. Uh, we, the city has also done a lot of land banking for affordable housing, as I'm sure you've read about. Um, so that gives us more flexibility to determine the direction of parcels and to require affordability or, or to get the right um, public good from parcels. And then we've also been piloting some in, an incentives program. So essentially that means it, how can we work proactively with developers in the community to bring them into the fold if they're interested in including affordable housing in their developments? How can we provide technical assistance for them, pair them with other partners that already do that work to just encourage more dedicated income restricted housing in the community? And an example of, of one of those projects, of sort of a pilot project or um, a test case, was what's now called the Row Workforce Condominiums. And this project is across the river. And folks may remember, I think it came to the city in 2019, and the developer needed what's called a right-of-way vacation for that project. And in return for that right-of-way vacation, the city leadership and city council was really aggressive and yeah. 
That's a good question. I'm so bad at describing it. It's essentially publicly owned land that is not currently being used, but but has a cost for it, right? So at the row, it was sort of just like an alley space, right? It's um, preserved in case a future road or alleyway needs to be. Yeah. And so in this case, uh, off over many years, the, the, a road was never built there. <laughs> and so it was just land, essentially. Um, and so city leadership was really aggressive in that project and in requesting uh, public good in return for that vacation. And part of that, there were a lot of elements there in terms of historic preservation and native grasses, um, but part of that was including income restricted workforce housing in the development. And so now we're seeing the, the end product of that, which is the row workforce condominiums, they're for sale now. And you have, they're capped at 120% of area median income. So folks above that are not eligible to purchase the condos. Um, and they're not able to be used for short-term rentals, and there are some other requirements there. So they're really intended to be dedicated for folks who live in the community, work in the community, and meet that income level. Uh, and that project has been a partnership with the North Missoula Community Development Corporation, who will help administer and make sure that into perpetuity those units remain affordable as they turn over. All right, so to the last program. Um, I mentioned our, our houseless programs and the coordinated entry system. That is a really essential piece of the work that we do for our unhoused neighbors at the city. And the coordinated entry system was created in 2017. And I think to understand the system, it helps to think a little bit about what it was like before 2017 to try to access housing support. So if if you were facing housing instability or you were unhoused or unsheltered before 2017 in Missoula, it, the onus was really on you to go around to each organization to kind of identify organizations that might have resources for you and to knock on the door and say, this is my situation. Do you have help? Do you have anything that can support me? And a lot of times the answer might be no. So then you'd have to go to the next organization and the next organization. And the coordinated entry system cre did just that. It coordinated all of those service providers um, in one space and created this concept of no wrong door so that if you can go to one of those organizations, you can get assessed into the system. So it's really just a questionnaire of you know, your demographics and what your situation is, what are your needs. Um, and then that is uploaded into a database so that all of those partners can work together to assess who is most vulnerable or most at risk and then match them with services and resources that are a good fit. Because of course, a lot of our partners work within programs that have federal requirements that are targeted for certain populations. Um, so that helps just streamline that system for folks who are trying to access services. So let's see. The other really important part of the coordinated entry system is it gave us real-time data on our neighbors and Missoulians who are unhoused. So before we had coordinated entry system, we relied on what was called a point in time count, which was also created by HUD, the national level. And it's just one night in January in communities, we still do this for HUD funding, but you go out and you observe, try to observe everyone who is unhoused or unsheltered to get a count of what that population looks like in the community, which as you can imagine is a really challenging way to get a pulse on what the needs are and, and who is experiencing housing instability one time a year in January. So the coordinated entry system has given us more real-time data on the folks who are experiencing housing instability and who are unhoused so that we can tailor our resources. We can write better grant applications. We can talk about what the real gaps are in the system and problem solve around them. So in October, we knew that we had 80 veterans who were unhoused in the community. We had 68 families. Uh, 452 individuals uh, over 25 and 37 under 25. And it just gives that, us that snapshot uh, uh, to understand where folks are. 
And then my last example, I promise, um, is what's called the Centralized Housing Solution Fund. So this is what's called a diversion fund in, in the world of, of houselessness. And it's for folks who are houseless or at risk of losing housing. And it's really flexible funding, which is hard to find in, the, in this realm. Um, it is really essential to help folks problem solve and, and divert so that they don't become unhoused or spend too long in that state so that they can problem solve and get to, to where they need to go. So it might be rent assistance, assistance, it might be utility deposits, pet deposits, relocation assistance, um, application fees. It's, it's a really flexible fund and it's been really widely used in the community. And it was recently funded by our local affordable housing trust fund. And so this the, the fund itself is a partnership between the United Way and the Human Resource Council. And they have been successful in recent years in bringing in foundation funding. But I think as we're finding a lot as we come out of COVID, funding streams dry up or it's diverted elsewhere. And so to keep that fund going, they've uh, applied to the trust fund and been able to use some of those funds for this centralized housing solution fund. So. I wanted to share that one because I, I think it's a really good example of creative problem solving, partnerships across the community, and just innovating test cases, running pilot programs to see if we can get to uh, fill those gaps that we're seeing in the community, um, which I think is kind of the spirit of this community development concept. So with that, I will turn it over to Walter. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Walter Banziger. I'm the Deputy Director of Development Services. Um, I joined CPDI back in the summer of 2021 after spending the majority of my career planning and designing college campuses at uh, one here in Montana, which I won't name because it's not in this town. Uh, and then also one out of state. And then I also spent a good portion of my career also in the private sector uh, helping developers and uh, citizens design homes, uh, develop subdivisions and properties uh, also here in the state of Montana. So I bring to development services a little bit of the bureaucratic side of the state as well as the private sector, understanding what the private sector needs to do and what they're going through in terms of developing um, properties and land in the state of Montana. So what is development services? We essentially guide uh, the community vision, or we guide developers uh, to form that community vision and promote life safety. So think of us as the implementers. We basically, yes. Could you speak into the point? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So we essentially guide developers uh, towards the community vision, and we also promote life safety within um, the community as well. Uh, our, we are the implementers. We help developers build things. We help uh, homes get permitted. Um, we oversee life safety issues and inspection. So our elements are uh, overseeing implementation of the growth policy and the zoning regulations. Um, implementing life safety as it relates to the building and land use environment. We will permit businesses as well as uh, business licensing and um, building permits, et cetera, as, and engineering permits, land use permits. And then we also uh, do compliance of the ordinances related to health and life safety. In terms of what we do for life safety, that would be the ordinances related to Title 20, so like land use. So if somebody's building something without a permit, um, we will go out and uh, check to make sure that they have the right permits for building their house. We will enforce um, uh, citizen complaints if someone's not mowing their lawn and the grass is growing too tall for uh, you know fire hazard issues. We will investigate um, snow removal, uh, rights of way, if uh, right of way is blocked by an abandoned vehicle, we will assist the, the police department in those kind of things. So 
that's kind of what we're doing. Not life safety in terms of like hospitals or, or police duties. We don't do the, the police enforcement. We do the uh, code enforcement of land use and building. So development services is basically uh, made up of four sections. Uh, we have the building department, uh, current planning, code compliance, and then permit and business licensing. Uh, building department is pretty much uh, what it uh, describes. It's uh, overseas plan reviews of actual building designs. Um, they do the inspection after the building is being, uh, is while the building is being built. And we're also the point of contact for uh, the citizen to check on permits, view their permits, submit their permits, and we administer that citizen portal where the citizen and developer can upload their drawings uh, to the city for review. Current planning and zoning uh, oversees private development and project review for boards appeal. They're also uh, oversees zoning compliance and review of land use permits. Uh, they assist building, per building with um, making sure that the building is correctly uh, designed for the site. So if it's zoned as a commercial, uh, or a residential, um, we're ensuring that the right type of building is being built in that zone. Uh, code compliance goes through and does the code enforcement after the fact. If there are issues that aren't being addressed or if there are problems, uh, they will help investigate. And then permitting and business licensing is the point of contact. They're the first point of contact for the citizen that when they submit their drawings, it goes through our permitting um, department to be first checked and then distributed to all the departments that do the review. And then they also document the project. And then they're also the last point of contact issuing the certificates of occupancy and the completion permits. And they also handle all the business licensing for um, the city of Missoula. Our department, as I said, is made up of four sections. Um, within the building officials department, our building um, department, we have the building official who is the authority having jurisdiction uh, regarding building issues in the city. Uh, he oversees three plan reviewers that review all the plans and five inspectors as well as two uh, business and computing data support folks that uh, are in that area. <clears throat> then we have current planning and zoning review manager, which is the current planning department. We have eight planners and two supervisors in that area uh, as well as the manager. And then we have the code compliance supervisor who is assisted by two code compliance officers uh, for the entire city. And then we also have the permit and business licensing manager that has five permitting uh, coordinators and licensing coordinators that do all the processing of the uh, permits and licensing for the entire city. So current planning. Current planning team assists the citizens with private development projects. Their job is to review zoning compliance and building permits as it relates to the zoning code and also towards our growth policy. Um, they will assist uh, developers by uh, reviewing their subdivision uh, projects and then take those to the city council for formal approval and, and also to the land use uh, uh, board for review and recommendation. Um, in addition to the uh, projects that they're reviewing in terms of buildings, they also will do uh, rezoning. If a county property is close to the city and it looks to be developed, they will review it for potential annexation into the city if it meets certain criteria. Uh, if a per, uh, citizen wants to change the zoning of their property, they will evaluate that property against the uh, growth policy, and then make recommendations on how that property could be rezoned. So if somebody owns a business and they would like to expand it or grow it and it requires a zoning change, they will evaluate that property to see if it meets the criteria and that it can be changed to something. Or if a single uh, family, if there's a home on a piece of property and they want to uh, convert that maybe to a townhome or a multifamily, they will evaluate that property against the growth pop policy and see if it meets the zoning to do that. They'll look at subdivisions, which is, I'll get into further uh, in a few slides. 
They'll look uh, at Board of Adjustment variances. So if something doesn't meet zoning uh, in Title 20, they will evaluate that and then present it to the Board of Adjustment for potential uh, variance approval. Uh, they have the Design Review Board and Design Excellence, which relates to buildings uh, themselves uh, and how they're designed and what they look like. Evaluate sign permits, uh, building permits. Again, I mentioned that before of how they sit on the property. They will also do floodplain uh, permits and zoning compliance permits. And the zoning compliance permit is basically the permit that says that the proposed project is appropriate for that piece of property. So Title 20, it, that's our zoning ordinance for the city of Missoula. Aaron mentioned that's the one that we're looking at revising uh, through our code reform uh, policy uh, or process that we're currently working on. It applies to all development, both public or private within the city limits of the city. And its primary purpose is to protect and promote the public health, safety, and general welfare of the community through land use and building design. We implement the policies and goals contained in the officially adopted growth policy, and it governs land uses, parcels, property parcels, basically, and building standards, and then how those buildings are also designed. Subdivision is another thing that the planners work on. Subdivision basically is the dividing of large plots of land into smaller plots of uh, parcels. Uh, it includes the roads, the rights of way, which we talked about earlier. So the rights of way, when a developer is looking at dividing a large property, they may do it in phases. They may have what they call prop, uh, paper roads, and they develop a right of way for that paper road so it could be developed and built sometime in the future, and it protects that. So they'll do the rights of ways, the park land, ensure that it's the proper amount of land is preserved for uh, recreational use. Common areas also for recreational use. And then alleys that will support the, the development of the property. There are two different types of, of subdivisions. There's a minor subdivision, which is five lots um, or fewer, which doesn't go through as deep a review process or as complex a review process. And then there's major subdivision, which is six lots or more, and that requires quite an extensive review involving environmental reviews, uh, engineering reviews, water, et cetera, to make sure that it's not detrimental to the community or the environment that we uh, are promoting here in Missoula. It's a comprehensive process, as Aaron mentioned earlier. Uh, subdivision is regulated by the state and so we need to follow a lot of the state processes and need to um, ensure that we follow the Montana code in terms of how subdivisions are evaluated. And then they also have to meet the, the regulations within Title 20. Boards and councils, the uh, planners are the liaisons through to many of the boards and councils uh, in council, city council for the city. So they uh, intend basically put together all the reports and the uh, recommendations for the Board of Adjustment, which decides variance requests from a zoning a compliance perspective. If it's related to the design of the building, such as uh, how much area of glass or what type of materials it's using or how tall it is or how short it is, that goes into the design. So that goes to the design review board. Again, the planners will put together a report. They will evaluate. They'll make a recommendation. And then it goes to the design review board for things that are above and beyond the administrative um, line that we can approve. So a lot of times what you'll find at board of adjustment and design review boards is that there's a level that we can do administratively through myself or Aaron at the recommendation of our planners. If it is complex, large, has a significant impact to the community, we take it to a community board of volunteers of those two boards for them to give a recommendation as well. The planning board, uh, that's uh, reviews um, recommendations on rezoning, annexation, and subdivisions, and then they make their recommendation to city council for approval. And then we have city council, which has the oversight if a citizen doesn't agree with any of the decisions that planning's, planning makes or the board or design review board or the planning board makes, they can go to city council for appeals. And then uh, we do, city council also is responsible for conditional use approvals, 
rezoning, annexation, so the city council makes the final determination if the property will be annexed into the city, and they also make the final decisions on subdivisions on whether they are approved or not. And that's just an example of a couple of the projects that we have done here in the city. Uh, let's see. This one is Hellgate. Um, this is over on the north side of town. I don't remember what this one is. Do you remember that one is, Aaron? That's a proposal for Fox Triangle. Can I pick up to, to, to be done, though? To be done. Both of these two are to be done. Yeah. The uh, proposal either for Riverfront Triangle or... Yes, I think that one was an older one for Riverfront Triangle. And this one is uh, some townhomes. I don't know exactly the location of that one. Which is a subdivision that was just approved in the Mullen Road area that will be our first, um, what they're turning Agri Hood. It's a community garden um, subdivision of townhomes and condos. So we have our building department here. Again, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Building official, he's the authority or agency having jurisdiction over all building-related issues. Uh, they interpret, uh, the building official interprets the official codes uh, for our jurisdiction, and I'll get into the codes in a few minutes. And they, he oversees the management and guidance of the reviews and the inspection teams, so the re planning reviewers and the inspection teams that go out and check projects after they're, while they're being constructed. He also administers the building code's effectiveness grading schedule, which I'll get into also in the next uh, slide or two. Plan review, uh, pretty much self-explanatory, but basically we have three plan reviewers that review all building plans for compliance to the state and locally adopted codes for new construction, residential, remodel, and commercial. They apply the state codes uh, and review those drawings so that the, ensuring that the codes are included within the drawings. So they're basically checking the architects and engineers' work. Uh, and, then they, and then they also administer the Acela system, which is the citizen's portal for where these drawings are all uploaded uh, by the uh, citizen in the online permitting system. Inspection is made up of five inspectors. They'll go out and check and make sure that once the drawings are approved for building, that the buildings are being built like they were shown in the drawings. So if they're supposed to have two exit stairs, they are being built with two exit stairs and that, the, that they're being built with the proper code so that things aren't being missed. The outlets are at the right height. Um, the exit doors are wide enough, et cetera. So sometimes the drawing may say it requires a 36 inch door and the builder may make a mistake and put in a 28 inch door. The code inf inspectors are there to check that and make sure to make sure that the building is properly built. Um, and then also the inspections can be set up through a public system, through text, phone call, or web-based, um, and it's all automated, and usually those are done the next day. These are the state adopted building codes. There's quite a few of them. Uh, this is in addition to the Title 20 Title 12 and Title 15 that Aaron talked about earlier. The building official is responsible for ensuring that the, these building codes are followed. These are state adopted building codes that then the city adopts as well. So we have the international building code, which is basically commercial buildings or buildings that um, are multifamily. We have the IRC, which is the international residential code, which is usually one and two family homes. Uh, and these are codes that are spread all across the country. So these are not just used in the state of Montana, but they're generally used in pretty much every state, except for California and New York, which add their own things to them for various reasons. IECC is the International Energy Conservation Code. Um, that's to help ensure buildings are designed to be energy efficient. Uh, international existing building code is if there is uh, a reason that the international building code can't be applied to an old historic building, they can, architects and engineers can uh, substitute the international existing building code in for the IBC, which gives them some leeway in uh, historic preservation issues, energy efficiency issues for older buildings. 
Then there's the fuel and gas code, the international mechanical code, which is your HVAC systems, air conditioning, heating, and, and ventilation systems, national electric code, lights and outlets, uniform plumbing code, and then they also oversee accessible accessibility, federally mandated accessibility guidelines for handicap accessibility to a building. And then the National Fire Protection Association code, which is uh, in conjunction with the fire department, making sure that as a building also exists, that it maintains its fire safety uh, over, the, over its life. So. so we mentioned the building code's effectiveness grading schedule. This is an ISO program that is, uh, rates the department on how effectively they enforce these codes. The grade is also used as a multiplier to determine the local insurance um, for homeowners insurance rates. So the better the enforcement of the code department, generally, if they are applied correctly, they um, wait, lower our rates when the insurance companies evaluate the community. Uh, grades are scaled on a 1 through 10, with 1 being exemplary, and Missoula's current rating is a 4. And that's an example of a failure by a contractor uh, in one of their construction sites when they didn't uh, properly do their um, structural. And we can see how the, what's, that's the one on Mullen, yes. That was local. Uh, someone backed into the post, broke it loose. So um, it met code, um, but in the inspections, this right here failed. The uh, connection failed when a vehicle, I believe, hit it. Code compliance, uh, the primary uh, function of code compliance is to investigate and correct violations of the city building and zoning ordinance, public works and mobility codes, which is Title uh, 15, and other similar um, land use and building regulations. So their area of services primarily starts with investigating citizen complaints. Uh, we are a complaint-driven uh, department, so our, and generally we wait for someone to give us a uh, call us and make a complaint, and that's our first priority is to go out and investigate those. Um, those can be related to snow, hazardous vegetation, somebody's building next to, uh, you know, putting up a fence, and they might be putting it on somebody else's property. Uh, so if somebody calls up and complains, um, our code enforcement uh, uh, Officers go out and look at that and investigate and then make a determination. Uh, they generally try to uh, resolve things amicably first before they go to the violation part. Um, sometimes they have to, but they are generally good negotiators. Um, so they prov do the investigation and enforcement. Uh, in, with these life safety issues, they also go out and investigate building standards. So if a building is determined to be uh, unsafe to occupy, they will work with the building official to uh, determine that and then to notice that building and then ensure that um, the people have time to either vacate it or it is make sure it's not occupied. Uh, again, they'll check on rights of way, snow, hazardous vegetation, and other relation, uh, uh, issues related to those codes. They are collaborative. Um, they work with fire, police department, engineering, uh, the attorney's office, streets, parks and recs, as well as our internal departments with planning and, um, and building. Uh, the code uh, enforcement folks also go out and they will do parks uh, evaluations. So uh, we have certain codes that require landscaping for multifamily housing and commercial, and they'll go out and check on those permits as it's being built to make sure that when those buildings are done, the right amount of trees are put in, the grass is planted, uh, the sidewalks are correct, and so forth. So here's your first quiz. There are th these three uh, pictures denote violations. Does anybody see where they are? Two are probably pretty easy. The fence is in the right alley. Correct. Out of vegetation. 
What's that? Yes. Overgrown vegetation, which can be a fire hazard, and that's why we enforce that. Yes. And the last one is the shoveling of the sidewalk. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, snow removal. Okay. And then the last group that uh, I have is our permit and business licensing coordinators. As I mentioned before, these are your first point of contact and your last point of contact when working with development services. They do the intakes of all business license applications. They do the intakes of building permits, um, engineering permits in terms of excavating permits, uh, land use development permits, all sorts of things. So they're the ones who take that in, check it, make sure everything is in there, and then they distribute it to the rest of the teams for review. Uh, they'll track it in the Acela program that I mentioned before. Um, they're also responsible for reviewing those uh, scopes of work and then assessing the appropriate fees. So they'll go through the city's uh, fee chart and make sure the correct amount of fees are and then bill the developer or the homeowner or the property developer for uh, the work that's being done. Uh, they serve as the point of contact. They're the primary points of contact when somebody calls up and says they need something, they need some help. How do I get into a cella? How much do I have to pay? Uh, what's the status of my permit? These are the folks that are the first point of contact. Um, they also do all the business licensing, as I said, and they'll take all the applications for anyone who is a business owner in the city of Missoula, and those are renewed typically every year. In a given year, uh, this is, I believe, our 2021 data. One-touch building permits, they process 3,495 of them in 2021. A one-touch permit is something that doesn't require an extensive review. If you're a homeowner and you want to put in some new electrical outlets or uh, you're renovating your bathroom and you want to put in a new toilet um, or a bathtub, generally you need a permit for that, but it doesn't require drawings in a review, so they call it a one-touch. You submit an application. They review it, give you uh, the permit, uh, tell you what you have to pay for a permitting fee so that, and then they put it into the system, and then the inspector comes out and inspects it uh, as you're doing the work or completing the work. Building permits, um, those are a little more complex. We processed 1,323 of those in 2021. Those included new and remodel, single family residence, multifamily, and commercial buildings. Those are the more complex permits that require extensive drawings uh, to be reviewed by the planners, the engineers, the building uh, review, plan reviewers, sometimes parks and rec, and often fire department. And again, they're the liaisons between all those departments. 153 ZCP and sign permits were processed also in that year. Public work permits, 2,839. Those are primarily engineering permits that relate to new fences, rights of ways, concrete sidewalks, driveways, excavation for utilities, uh, and any other kind of paving. Sign permits would be anybody who wants to put up a commercial sign uh, in their uh, building. So if they're a business owner and they don't have a sign but they need to put one up, uh, it requires a sign permit. So they'll go out and those are required to be applied for so that we review those through planning to make sure they meet the zoning uh, ordinances for that particular district. And each zoning area has different requirements that can be so big, so bright, um, so many. So there's, there's rules involved in that. Uh, 680 new business licenses were processed and 4,040 renewed licenses. Um, those are processed between the six coordinators. On average, they'll get 30 calls per day and 80 emails per day um, are sent out by them to uh, the citizens in relation to the work that they're doing. And that's our presentation. This is our contact information for Aaron, Montana, and myself. And then also the contact information for our front desk, which is CPDI's administration. Uh, if you're looking at doing a building permit for the permits and coordinators or a business license, uh, that would be the permits number. If you have a question on zoning, which would be land use, what's my zoning? Can I build this kind of building here? What are my setbacks if I want to put an addition on my house? Um, if I have a piece of property that I want to build a 
a townhome or a uh, apartment building on, am I allowed to do it? The zoning would be the contact for that. And then for inspection, um, that's if the pro project's already in process and construction's being done. Uh, there are certain stages that inspection has to be done, often at excavation, foundation, framing, insulation, electrical, plumbing, um, and so forth. And then there's final inspections that give uh, a certificate of completion, or if it's a brand new building, a certificate of occupancy, which legally authorizes that building to be uh, used. That's it. Thanks, that was a ton of information because this department does a ton of work. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break. There's some goodies in the back and I, I challenge you to talk to someone that you haven't talked to yet. Um, so take 10 minutes and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions and kind of follow up, but tons of information and thank you, Montana, Walter and Aaron, thank you so much. So if everybody wants to take a seat again, um, we'll get started up for our, just our last section here of questions and answers. Thanks so much. And I, I did just have a couple comments before um, I turn it over to, to these four, including Mike. And I would say, first of all, if you ever have the time to take a look at the city of Missoula's growth policy, I would recommend you look it up. You don't have to read the entire thing. You certainly don't have to read the appendixes at the end, but you should read enough of it to get a sense of what it says about our community because there was a lot of thought and work. We are, we are mandated by the state of Montana to do, do them every 20 years, I believe. So I think we passed this one in 2015 or 2016. Updates every five. I, I was not involved in city government when it was being worked on, but there was a huge amount of outreach, a huge amount of work, and I, as I was first running for office in 2015, I read it, and I was so impressed with what a thoughtful document it was, how it truly reflected our values, it's forward thinking, it has vision, um, and I do think we are great in Missoula at creating policy, and then we have to figure out how to implement it, and that's, that is a big challenge. But I would, first of all, say, look up that growth policy and take a look at it, and it, makes you feel good about Missoula. That's the way I felt when I read it. The other thing is, I'm gonna just tell a teeny little story, and I don't want anybody to blush over here in the planning department. Um, but I remember last fall being at a retreat that the entire CPDI department was at. And you have to remember, this is a department that is in charge of housing, and with the pandemic, our already severe housing issues greatly intensified. They're in charge of housing those who don't have houses. That's a big job that greatly increased during the pandemic and climate change. So, you know, it's all, it, this, this is literally what's on their to-do list. And I remember being at this retreat talking to one of the planners because a big topic of course coming up was code reform. And we had the federal dollars because of the pandemic to put towards that big project, because that's very, very expensive to do, and it's very hard to pull that out of our regular budget. And in terms of housing, there's so much with our housing costs, we cannot control demand. People are gonna move to Missoula, Yellowstone is filming, we've been discovered, you know, demand will go up. One of the few things we can control are the tools that we have to influence the design and safety of what's being built. That's code reform, and if we can do that better, that's a good thing. So I was talking to this planner, and he was talking about code reform coming up and he said, you know, I feel like for the last few years, I've been driving a Yugo on an interstate going 80 miles an hour surrounded by semi trucks. And with code reform, and the, and the check engine light is on. He said, with code reform, we're pulling off to check what's going on underneath the engine and make it better. And I just thought that was such a great way of, so I hope that's okay to share that there. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to, so we have Mike Nugent from City Council, who is the head of the Land Use and Planning Committee, which, of course, handles anything they need to get through council. I'm going to turn it over to staff and Mike to answer questions from all of you. So I'll turn this over. Who wants, who wants the mic? Who, who has a question? Yeah, that's a great question. I can speak some, and I'm sure our LUP chair has some to offer as well. Um, 
Yeah. So, so uh, who approves code reform? How does that how does that process of approval occur? And so, um, everything we do on a policy basis at the city of Missoula ultimately has to be approved by city council. Our elected leaders who are elected to represent all of you and all of our residents in Missoula. And so it kind of works its way through several channels to get to that final approval with city council, which requires a legally mandated public hearing um, and an opportunity for the public to come in and share their concerns, share their concerns directly with our elected officials. Um, but then we go back to that engagement process that we talked about that we we want to reach deeper and have that additive process. And so we're, we're adding a lot in there to make sure that the public it doesn't just learn about this when we advertise the public hearing, but that everybody's really steeped in the work before it gets there. I do feel like there will be some of the public who just learned about it at the public hearing, despite our best efforts. Um, the thing about projects like Code Reform is there's so much collaborative effort that goes into it. It's going to be a two-year process, and the, the the process that staff has has laid out and put together is really heavy on community involvement. So I would be absolutely shocked if by the time the recommended code got to council if it was all that controversial. I'm sure there'll be people and opinions and things like that. But the idea is to really listen to the community and engage stakeholders, including some that, that don't generally and traditionally participate in, in public processes like that, to develop a code that really works for everybody, from a, from a builder to just a, a homeowner trying to redo their deck to a citizen who's got a concern with their neighbor and kind of that wraparound code. So um, it ultimately, yes, it has to be approved by the city council, but the process that's going to lead to the, to the final recommendations, I think, is going to be so, th so thorough that it would be very hard to have somebody on council say, I don't like this, take this in another direction. Knock on wood and do all the things that you need to do. I want to follow up on that question because I was at an event today, and in fact, uh, what an event your park was as well with the uh, uh, Common Good Missoula, and it was about the, the project. And one of the comments was made that this is very unique in the work that the city is doing with Common Good Missoula, and in fact, apparently, you can't find another thing nationally where this is being done. So I'm curious, two questions. One, how did that come about? And number two, what excites you about this thing that apparently nobody else has ever done in the nation? I'll tell you what excites me, and then I'm going to hand it to these three that actually know what they're talking about to answer the question. What excites me is that um, as the process has been rolling out and there was a kickoff in December at the fairgrounds and, and some of you in this room were there and we were in an LUP planning meeting ahead of time and we were kind of talking about the process and you could tell that everybody in the room had a little bit of a we're getting taken out of our comfort zone by this process. And to me that means it's going to be a good process because we're not doing things the way we've always done them but rather kind of trying to, to engage new people. So that's what excites me about it. I'm going to let the professionals actually answer your question. Yeah, so, you know, I think it really came about when we started to um, sit down and talk about our hopes and dreams for code reform and, um, and also reflected on what we had been hearing from the community for several years, really started to bubble up around the murder of George Floyd as we went into the pandemic, um, that our residents expected more of us. We needed to do better. As it, uh, as it applied to the way that we were communicating and in conversation with our community. And so we knew with an effort this big, we could not roll out the status quo. We had to do better. And so we started to talk to partners in the community and ask them, how do we do better? How do we reach deeper into our community? How do we, how do we make sure we're talking to people and getting seats at the table, especially for those who historically have been left out of the process, either because we haven't invited them into it or because we haven't removed the barriers that prevent them from participating. Um, and what we heard overwhelmingly is that um, you create it with us. You don't invite us to it after you've created it. And so, um, which seems so simple, right? <laughs> but is not the way government works. It just isn't the way government has functioned. And so it wasn't something new um, and something exciting and scary. I have a high risk tolerance. And so I I'm okay with being a little bit scared. Um, we're either going to succeed fantastically or fail fantastically, but there's no mediocre <laughs> 
so so that's kind of how we went into it, taking a, a big uh, a big leap of faith and sharing power with Common Good in a way that we never had before. That we are co-creating this engagement process. Um, city's not calling the shots here, and Common Good's not calling the shots either. That we're doing this together, and Common Good is is bringing with them representation from the community that does reach deep, right? That gets um, that gets space and power for people who have been historically left out before, and so. So it was something new for us, and we had to work real hard to get folks on board with that. Um, and we had to work real hard to build trust with Common Good in, in that power sharing. It wasn't just one-sided, right? We had to prove to them that they could trust us in this process as well. And I think in that work took eight or nine months. It, it was not fast work. Um, it took quite a while, but we're in a place now where we all really trust each other. We know we're moving in the same direction. Um, Common Good, uh, Lisa Davies, for those of you that don't know her, she is just this fantastic, passionate advocate for the organization. Um, and she has this great analysis analogy that as we move through code reform, the city and common good are, um, we're traveling this river together, but we're kind of in our own boats. Um, and sometimes we're going to be traveling together through different engagement cycles. And sometimes we're going to part and common good's going to do their own thing. They're going to have some house meetings. They're going to do some engagement, some door to door, um, door knocking that the city's probably not going to be a part of. The city's also going to hold these public hearings and we're going to do these other pieces that common good is probably not going to be a part of, but we're traveling to the same place together. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we've defined what that success is together. And so we feel pretty good that we'll get there. I guess I would just reiterate what Aaron said. Probably the couple of things that excite me the most about the project is the collaborative nature um, is getting and as Aaron said, it's not just the city making a decision and saying, okay, here's what we decided and here's what's going on. We have the professional consultants, we have common good, we have the citizens. Um, we're very early in the process right now and we're still planning a lot of these things out. But uh, as Aaron mentioned, we do plan on having numerous different kinds of public engagement, whether they're online, whether they're um, uh, in person, or going out knocking door to door, we're working all those plans out. We have a communication uh, specialist, local specialist is part of the team that's brought in to help guide us with some of these communications. And, and I think that this is gonna be a very unique process. As you mentioned that um, we're gonna approach it in a very unique way and get a, as much input from areas that we normally wouldn't see. It's not gonna be just your, your you know, there's, there's members in the community that are are good at making their opinions known and bringing their uh, their ideas to the table. But then there are many that are not, and those are the ones that we want to get to as well. So we want to hear from both of those groups in the in the citizens. Yes. Ooh, I'd let Aaron probably can probably speak better than that. Um, um, so yeah, we have we've identified a lot of different stakeholder groups throughout this process, and. We kind of talk about them as the code users, right? Folks um, in our community that interact with the code on a daily basis, our architects, our engineers, um, contractors. Um, they know where a lot of those uh, kind of pinch points are throughout the code. Um, but then we have non-code users who care greatly about the way our community develops, about the way their neighborhood develops, um, about their ability to own a home in our community in five years or 10 years or today. Um, and, and those conversations are probably going to be more value-based, right? We want to understand what's really important to you so that when we're talking with these code users and they're like, well, we need to allow X, Y, or Z, we can think about, again, that, that growth policy, that code connection. If we do that, does that actually help us achieve our goals? Does that take us where we want to go? And so we're trying to think broadly about that. Um, some of those non-code users are, are everyday Missoulians, but they're also our conservation community, our agriculture community. Um, our sustainability community. Um, there are also business owners in our community that are struggling to find workers because they can't afford homes. Um, it really impacts everybody on a different level. And so we're trying to think about what those impacts are and pull those folks into the conversation. I had a question as to how much the county does similar to what you guys are doing. Is there how much duplication is there going on doing what they have to do it's similar to your functions. That's a really good question. So 
So how, do, how does the city and the county work together? Where is their duplication? Um, the city and the county, as it applies to our land use work, we work really closely together, and, and I'll let Walter talk a little bit about that. We, um, and, and also as it applies to our housing initiatives and our climate work as well, um, we, we know that there's a line, right? That after you cross that line, there's different code, there's different policies, but for all of you in this room and for 99.9% .9 of Missoulians, nobody cares where that line is, right? And so it's not that different between um, whether you live in the city and the county. And so we really try to, to make sure that we're collaborating and communicating about that. Um, I would say from a collaborative process, we meet with the county uh, often. Uh, we have regular meetings with them in terms of land use annexations into the city. We have uh, a interlocal agreement where we have developed um, grades of, of distances and requirements for properties to stay either in the county or to be annexed into the city. Those could include how close they are to city uh, to city lines now. Uh, it can include access to utilities, including transportation, water, and sewer. Um, so we do a lot of that kind of coordination. And in terms of, of we want to protect the environment, so often what we're looking for is working with the county to take properties off of sewer, uh, off of septic systems and put them on the city sewer system, which is more environmentally uh, appropriate and uh, a better way to deal with that. So we work with them on those kind of things often. So there is uh, a little bit of duplication in terms of planning. They have their own planning department. We have our own planning department. But they deal with their land slightly different. Their ordinances uh, are different than ours because they deal with septic systems. And we'll deal with uh, sewer and water. Uh, we deal with transportation. And then when there's a crossover, then we collaborate with them on those. Uh, in terms of transport, yes, that's part of that review, yes. The, so transportation we is part of those things that we look at when we're looking at annexing a property in or coordinating on road construction. But you'll probably hear about that more when you meet uh, public works and mobility, and they can speak more to uh, transportation because that's, er that's their area of expertise. Uh, it might be interesting for Ted to talk a little bit about her world interaction because I actually have more opportunities. Yeah. Like, how did you get into your role? Into my role? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, well, speaking of what I'm excited about with our code reform engagement as well. Um, so my background is in public administration. My education and, and all of my prior work has been in the public sector. I've worked for the federal government. Um, I've worked in the private sector and consulting around policy. Um, and then uh, did a master's of public administration. And I would say in terms of public engagement, in my educational experience, we talked a lot about how bad the government is at public engagement. And we looked at some interesting models around the country and over the course of time, but there, there isn't, in, in my kind of reading of it, there's not a lot of consistency. It's sort of like one-offs of what work in local context, um, kind of in the, in the, um, or in the uh, oh, I'm losing my words, <laughs> in the local landscape of kind of who's there, who's interested in the work. Um, so that's my background. And um, in terms of how we work with the county, uh, Missoula County, similar to the city in terms of housing and climate policy, they have staff like the city does. And we work really collaboratively with their staff because these are big issues, right? We can't the city can't just solve it within city limits without thinking about the urban fringe and, and the larger county. So we work a lot on policy and program development, grant applications, kind of all of the pieces of that work. Um, and it's really nice to have just that, that wider network of staff working on, on similar goals and policies. Uh, in the grants world, we also work really collaboratively with the county. The city, as I mentioned, in some of our housing funds, we get those directly from the federal government. The state of Montana also gets some of those same federal funding streams. And so Missoula County plays a really essential role in applying to those state level funds and bringing in more 
funds to help us achieve project goals because you know the the amount of funds that we get at the city level is not enough to fund a whole project or even a half a project or a third of a project so often we're partnering on the same project and creating a strategy for how to get in all of the funding that we need to support our partners in executing that work so trinity and bellagio are examples uh, the Clark Fork Inn uh, right now that's underway is funded by the city and then the county via the state as well. That's right, yeah, the Pavarello Center purchased the property and they're converting it for their, their veterans transitional housing program. Yes, yep, they've got VA funding too. You need a lot of, it's a complicated stack of funding to make those projects work. Gregory, did you? Yeah, so, thanks. With the discussion of grant funding and tying it back into the uh, support for local individuals, I'm curious, how is that, how is uh, that fund applied? Is that through rent or is that through ownership? And then if it's through rent, how are there any mechanisms to prevent landlords from exploiting those systems that are meant to protect um, at risk individuals. Yeah, so the, the, are you thinking about the centralized housing solutions fund, the last slide that I went through? Yeah, that's a good question. So that fund, the folks apply directly and then the funds go to the recipients. So they can then use that money for a security deposit or a pet deposit or, or whatever their need is. Um, so it's really just direct funding to the recipient and then they use it how they need to. Um, the, the piece about <laughs> landlords is a complicated one. We have very limited um, input and engagement on that landlord-tenant relationship in the state of Montana. And so we have tried over the years uh, different ways to build relationships with landlords. Our houseless program staff and, and all of the kind of direct service staff that work in the coordinated entry system, they work really hard to build those relationships to demonstrate that the clients they're working with can be reliable tenants and to build kind of goodwill in those relationships. Um, but all primarily it has to be incentives based and relationship based. Quick yes, no question. Is that like restriction on landlords, is that at the state level? And is that yep. something that the state has, has set? Yeah, yeah, so it primarily is through the State Landlord Tenant Act. And then there's also a section of state call, state code called powers denied that specifically denies local governments uh, certain powers that have to defer to the state. Yeah, that's that's a great connection. Thanks, Mike. So I, I did bring a very poorly printed <laughs> edition for your binders. It's meant for the web, so it doesn't print very well. It's kind of small, but it talks about what area median income is and how it's set. Um, and so all of our housing programs at the city level and then through our federal programs uh, rely on this number of area median income, which HUD updates every year to provide that, I guess, protection, like you said, to make sure that folks who are most in need are, are getting access to those programs. And so there's a lot of layers of complication in terms of how folks income qualify and what can be counted as assets. And we rely on our wonderful partner organizations to do that work locally. But that's one way that we can protect the limited resources that we have when we invest them in projects to make sure folks that are most in need are able to access those resources. Um, so projects like Trinity and Bellagio have, um, like I mentioned, that period of affordability. So for, I'm trying to think, 45 years, I think, for each of those projects, they have to maintain affordability. And then the organizations that um, will do the leasing will make sure folks' income qualify so that, the, that they're targeting the right um, segment of our residents who need those housing units. I just wanted to add or provide some additional clarity around the Landlord-Tenant Act and the Powers Denied. We often get asked, why, why can't we require developers to build a certain portion of affordable housing when they build. And during the last session, um, inclusionary housing was essentially 
banned by the legislature. We don't have the power or the ability to, to enact that, similar to rent control. Uh, so a lot of these policies that we're seeing or tools that we're seeing other communities deploy to try to address some of these situations are powers that have been denied to us by the state. And we are seeing new legislation um, this session that um, further uh, tips that scale of the landlord-tenant um, power dynamic, uh, some things like, for instance, uh, landlords being able to evict with as little as three-day notice. Um, and so those are things moving through the session right now. They have incredible support. They all are poised to pass. And so that's another opportunity for you to just um, follow along in those conversations. Yes, that would be, yep, with the lease violation. Absolutely. Yep. It's with it's with a lease violation, um, but it's the notification period is is moved to a much shorter window, typically from a 30 day window to a three day window. So even with a violation um, gives people a very short period of time to find alternative situations. Yeah. I have a question about housing or houselessness. Um, I understand, you know, you get the, the bond issue to in pass to subsidize the, to allocate money for Johnson Street, Clark Ford. Um, I'm just curious as a, as a community, as a city council, as, <clears throat> as our governing officials, what are the next three steps we're taking for the summer? What will happen in the summer? I feel like we've all been affected. We can, you could probably just walk three blocks of here and see a car. I mean, I know I see campers, uh, parked uh, out near Palmer Street, down by Walmart, on Walmart Reserve. Um, there's also stuff even if, um, near the Pav. Is a big, big issue there. You have um, people living in their vehicles. Um, my understanding is that we can't tow as a city. We can't tow a vehicle if someone's living in it. So I feel like we have sanitation, safety issues. Who's living in that camper? Who's, that, who's, who's our neighbor when they don't have an address? And what's the safety and the issues at the city? How is the city addressing those issues that pop up and managing long-term residents that are living on the street in those areas and dealing with the safety? And then what is the city's steps for the summer? Are they gonna open the camp up again? With no water, no sewer, and have poor bodies for these people again? That, that wasn't very nice. Do you want me to take the mic back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just start by saying that, that the levy did fail. <laughs> so we have limited funding streams to, to implement any program to address unsheltered houselessness. And we've seen an increase in our community, just like I think almost every community across the country as housing costs have risen, um, as we've seen the economy get a lot harder for a lot of folks on the margins. So uh, we're facing some really hard decisions around what what funds we do have available, what programs we can fund, um, and what outcomes that we need to see to be able to support folks who are unhoused and unsheltered. Yeah, and I think those decisions will be made during our next budget conversation, um, which will happen with city council and publicly. Um, the community did did make a decision with that levy. They made they made a decision not to fund those programs, and so how we carry forward with that um, is really to determine what we can do with the limited resources that we have now. It's highly unlikely that we'll be opening new programs or reopening programs that have closed um, without that funding that that we needed through that levy um, to make that happen. But those are conversations that that we'll be having through the budget um, process led by city council. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that what's what's really apparent is we're gonna have to take a look at what we're doing and, and prioritize, because we're not gonna be able to do everything because we've relied on some ARPA funds, we've relied on other sources, and, and there's not room in the general fund to, to do some of this. So I think we're gonna have to really focus on programs that are giving us results. And a great example is the temporary safe outdoor space um, and, and that model that um, I, I believe that it's it's almost a one and two, a little bit under one out of every two people who are there have either been able to transition to permanent housing, be reunited with family, or to obtain stable employment. And so 
looking at the programs that we have that are a success and kind of making sure that we can support those and then kind of try and tackle some of our other you know areas of concern but but the reality is that without funding we cannot do everything and it's it's going to be a tough budget conversation because um one of the things we really learned in in the conversation council had in the fall is that sometimes you can do harm by trying to do something too if you can't service it adequately and you need to have create safe environments where where um, you know, people can be comfortable, and if we can't do that, are we creating a, a worse situation than maybe we think we're solving? And I think it's it's going to be interesting, and we're going to rely on the expertise of our staff to really make recommendations, and and we're going to have some some tough conversations. So, so it's eight thirty, but super quick. Okay, I got you guys were late. I I was late getting you out last time, so I. But go ahead. I hear houses, I hear homes, I hear that's a priority. If you're saying that's a priority, and then you're saying funds aren't available, my question is, how is that a priority if funds aren't available? What are we making more important than to make this important? Because I, think, I feel like this is one of the things that affects the, the community as a whole, and it doesn't affect just one person. It is It affects everyone. So, I mean, it's we'll a tough try. I hear we'll try. It's a tough decision. But I feel like, you know, there's, there's, is there, when we put stuff on the ballot to vote for, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I just see, I guess, you know, as a city, as a city council person, if we're making it a priority, we're making it a priority. So, the, the tough thing is that it's easier said than done. Because I would absolutely tell you that we, we believe housing for everybody is a priority. And there are just so many pieces that go into this conversation. And we have to be careful when we say it breaks down to, well, if this is a priority, we could find funding because there's no one answer. Like, like solving this problem is a whole lot of different pieces kind of working together, both in the public sector and the private sector, to kind of make progress incrementally every day. And if we, if we said, funding shelters is our top priority we're gonna to have to take that funding from somewhere else and are we going to do more harm than good like for instance if if we have to to pull more into shelter and we pull an employee from this department here we're going to slow down the approval process and then all of a sudden the housing that we already are struggling to put out on time may slow down so we have to kind of weigh the do no harm while also trying to do good and one of the things that absolutely has been a a key part of our progress, in my opinion, is the mobile response team um, that currently lives in the fire department. And that that program was gonna be funded through um, the crisis service levy. Um, we, we as a council uh, agreed to sign a three-year lease for that program to find space. So th I think that shows that that is a priority, um, but money we spend there then doesn't go to a shelter but I'm of the opinion that if we stopped spending that money, we'd have an even greater need for a shelter than we have now. So it's, it's finding the balance on how these programs work together. So I agree with what you're saying, but sometimes I think it's easier said than done because there's a lot of things that go towards solving the problem that have to work together. Anyone want to add to that? Or? Um, I would add, that's what us city councilors do, I would just add, I think I referenced it last week, I think we are an underfunded municipality based solely, our revenue is solely on property taxes. And I talked about tax reform, and that's why I keep talking about it, because we are underfunded, so we have to make decisions where we can't do a lot of the basic things that I think we should be doing. And until our legislature changes those rules, we are not going to, we're, we're going to be raising property taxes more and more. And as you can see, we're starting to hit some ceilings there by the levy not passing. In the meantime, we're going to wait and see what the legislature does. And they'll be out of session in another two and a half months. But there's a bill right now where they would literally limit local government expenditures. So we got to wait and see what the lay of the land is and what tools we have. And then we, we do the best we can with what we have. So. And just one quick thing to add to that. Sometimes what, what, gets cut at the state level floats down to the city in an unfunded mandate sort of way or not even a mandate but just a if we want to be a community that cares about our residents and our people um, and the cuts that the state made 
to mental health three sessions ago at that level, you absolutely can draw a correlation to an increase in homelessness in our communities. And Missoula is a community that is trying to help solve that. So the state cut funding to cut to make their budget you know, feel better, but the problems don't go away. They, they float down and at the most basic level, that's what local government is. So then we're, as a community and our nonprofit partners as well, trying to solve those problems. So. Okay, so we will end it. We could go on forever, as you can tell. It's a complicated topic, but thank you, everyone.